let's talk about Napoleon. Napoleon, the movie uh, by Ridley Scott. Um, I was uh, expecting something relatively good simply because Ridley Scott is the director of Gladiator. And here you have Ridley Scott in his element having generated Gladiator, which is a very good movie, a historical reconstruction of Roman Empire times. And there he is with his actor that was performing very well in Gladiator, Joachim Phoenix. And Joachim Phoenix has kind of matured since because he's played some incredible roles like the Joker. And so you have all of the circumstances here to expect something that could be good. However, this movie fails. It fails at developing a script that makes more sense than history. See, if you allow yourself a historical epic movie and you allow some violations of historical accuracy to happen. Um, you should be able to, for these historical violations that you allow yourself, <clears throat> you should be able to make a better story than history. And the problem of Napoleon is that it's not better than history. It's, uh, the script in and of itself is just basic Wikipedia level history. It's this happened, then this happened, then this happened. We don't have a stunning acting performance that changes the view of Napoleon by Joachim Phoenix. We have kind of a weird acting performance where you ask yourself, is this really how Napoleon was? I'll read at the letters of Napoleon today and I think he might have been an artist, maybe a stoic like me, you know? I think that I could share a lot of characteristics with Napoleon when I read his uh, letters and, and he's like, he's annoyed at Josephine and he's calling her a slut. And it's like, woman, I expect you to be loyal to me. I'm out there doing some crazy stuff for us to survive. I w the least I would expect is when I come back to you, you're, you haven't slept with other guys. Uh, he, he, I feel uh, from just researching Napoleon, and that's what's so sad, it's that I had to research Napoleon rather than just take the, the, the movie that uh, Ridley Scott has produced, because normally I should have felt this from the movie. But it's almost impossible to feel anything from the movie because it's not deepened. At some point, this, the movie seems to be taking a direction that would be of the kind, you know, great men have one fucking issue and it's woman. And that could have been a superb message, but it's not, uh, it's not dominant in the movie. And even that kind of deepened look, although it could have been interesting, it doesn't really come out of the movie. I had to reread the letters of Napoleon to really feel, okay, maybe... Maybe there was some psychological deepening here that could have been possible. So when you look at the movie, uh, they, it's centered around a couple of historical points in <clears throat> Napoleon's life, important battles, but then mostly it's centered around the letters to Josephine, which are available on the internet, which even the movie they claim, well, it's after their divorce and after the death of Josephine, their valet uh, sold the letters on the black market, and that's why we have access to them today. Uh, so we have a loving Napoleon in these letters. I have your letters of the 16th and 21st. There are many days when you don't write. What do you do then? No, my darling, I am not jealous, but sometimes worried. Come soon, I warn you, if you delay, you will find me ill. Fatigue and your absence are too much. Your letters are the joy of my days, and my days of happiness are not many. Junot is bringing 22 flags to Paris. <clears throat> you must come back with him, you understand? Hopeless sorrow, inconsolable misery, sadness without end, 
If I am so unhappy as to see him return alone, adorable friend, he will see you, he will breathe in your temple, perhaps you will even grant him the unique and perfect favor of kissing your cheek, and I shall be alone and far, far away. But you are coming, aren't you? You are going to be here beside me in my arms, on my breast, on my mouth. Take wing and come, come. A kiss on your heart and one much lower down, much lower. So uh, Napoleon is writing these letters as he's on the front line of battle, uh, doing stuff, you know, getting engaged militarily. Uh, and he's getting frustrated because Josephine is a whore. She, that, that's the big problem. Josephine historically is just a real whore who really likes to get fucked by the French aristocracy and the French high-level elites. So she doesn't want to be on the front line of the war getting inseminated by Napoleon because she just likes having sex for escalating the social ladder. And she always she already owns Napoleon. He's already hers. And so she wants to use her whoring to uh, acquire more, more social networking within the scene of Paris elite. That is what's happening. I have received your letter, my adorable friend. It has filled my heart with joy. I am grateful to you for the trouble you have taken to send me the news. I hope you are better today. I am sure that you have recovered. I earnestly desire that you should ride, ride on horseback. It cannot fail to benefit you. Since I left you, I have been constantly depressed. My happiness is to be near you. <clears throat> Incessantly, I live over in my memory your caresses, your tears, your affectionate solitude, the charms of the incomparable Josephine kindle continually a burning and a glowing flame in my heart when, free from all solicitude, all harassing care, shall I be able to pass all my time with you, having only to love you and to think only of the happiness of so saying and of proving it to you? I will send you your horse, but I hope you will soon join me. I thought that I loved you months ago, but since my separation from you, I feel that I love you a thousandfold more. Each day since I knew, have I adored you yet more and more, this proved the maxim of Briere, that love comes all of a sudden to be false. Everything in nature has its own course and different degrees of growth. Ah, I entreat you to permit me to see some of your faults. Be less beautiful, less gracious, less affectionate, less good. Especially be not over-anxious and never weep. Your tears rob me of reason and inflame my blood. Believe me, it is not in my power to have a single thought which is not of thee, or a wish I could not reveal to thee. Seek repose. Quickly reestablish your health. Come and join me, that at least before death we may be able to say we were many days happy. A thousand kisses and one even to Fortuna, notwithstanding his spitefulness. <coughs> Fleur de Sel says, so he was a simp? Well, the movie does build around this, and there are scenes where, where he learns, uh, and we see from these letters that at some point he learns that him being away, his wife has taken a lover and is sleeping across the French elite. And in fact, he even sees it in the newspaper. I don't know that there was ever a newspaper publishing it. I'll have to check historically. Uh, but the movie presents it as he comes back to Paris and everyone knows that he's a cuck. Um, okay, uh, so he comes back and uh, she, she is uh, weeping and... He kicks her out at first and gets her, her stuff out of his house uh, under the rain, but she comes back and weeps at the door and gets back in. All of this is documented as having happened historically, so it's not made up by the movie. Um, and eventually, as she comes back, they say historically, they say that she never was disloyal again after this. Uh, but let's not forget that Josephine, uh, Napoleon wasn't uh, her first lover. She was married before, 
So the story is that she loses her husband, who had given her two children. And she loses him because he gets executed as part of the French Revolution, because he was somewhat in the military or police aristocracy. <clears throat> and uh, so she's uh, single with two children. Eventually, the children get... Uh, when she will marry Napoleon, the children will get cared for by some sort of state apparatus of the time. And now she's old. She's older than Napoleon. And that's one of the things that's kind of annoying about this movie. It's that the selection of the actors doesn't at all fit the historical reality. I've taken notes here. I've made the calculation. So Napoleon, in reality, is 27 when, when marrying Josephine. Josephine is 33. So that is a reality that is not captured at all in the movie. Because the reality is, if you wanted to play a real historical Napoleon, first he would be marrying an older woman. That's why she was infertile. That's why he never was able to have children with her. It's because they were not super together. And on top of it, she was getting old. Uh, so he was 27. She was 33. Now, what do we get as actors in the movie? Joachim Phoenix is 48. Vanessa Kirby is 34 at the moment of marriage. So you have in the movie, you have an old man fucking a relatively beautiful woman for his age. But in reality, you had a relatively fat, geeky Napoleon who was 27 fucking an infertile 33. That is the reality of what happened. And yes, Joachim Phoenix, having gone through cycles of food deprivation. <coughs> Sorry, I didn't have my mute button. Let me activate it here. Uh, Joachim Phoenix, having gone through cycles of food deprivation and having worked on his facial expression as part of the Joker performance, actually looks maybe a little older than 48, you know? Uh, he doesn't look like a sweet face, 48. He looks like a 57, says John Drake. He looks torn by existence. Uh, so I, I made the calculation. For historical realism, the Josephine that you see in the movie is played by Vanessa Kirby, Accurately, because she's just one year older than the real Josephine. But the Joachim Phoenix is 15 years older than the real Napoleon that he's playing. Uh, so that is, uh, that is something to take into account. The movie doesn't capture this reality because, because of the choice of actors here. Um, it's very annoying at the beginning, there's this song playing as the beginning is the French Revolution, 1790, and Marie Antoinette is getting her head chopped. That is how the movie begins. And they play uh, this music here, sung by Edith Piaf, a performance by Edith Piaf of an actual classical song of the 1790 period, of the true French Revolution. Which, uh, which basically says in French, ça ira, ça ira, ça ira, les aristocrates, on les pendra. Which means everything's going to be all right. We're going to hang the aristocrats. <laughs> it's been 300 years that they have promised us that we will get some bread. It's been 300 years that they gave us uh, parties. And that they entertain prostitutes. It's been 300 years that they crush us. So basically a revolutionary song. The problem is the one that is performed at the beginning is clearly a gramophone recording of Edith Piaf. <clears throat> it's not the way this song was performed in 1790. It's a very original, very modern, new version of this song. 
and you can hear the gramophone type of recording that you would get somewhere in the 40s, 50s, 60s. You can hear basically the vinyl aspect and the, the whole microphone aspect of it. If you're going to do an historical reconstruction of 1790 and choose a song that came from 1790, why don't you have a chorus of sing it in the way a crowd could have sung it in 1790? Instead, we get the, the new recording from the 20th century, basically 150 years later, and it shows, it shows in the lack of care of the historical reality here. How would a recording even be playing in 1790 as Marie Antoinette gets her head chopped? This is all sorts of details that are super annoying to someone who just knows basic history. And I'm not a history buff. I'm not hanging up to this kind of details usually. But they, they come out super obvious. Like I almost prefer the historical approach of Quentin Tarantino in The, the Inglorious Bastards. Um, because at least there's some sort of, okay... We're going to make up a story for why a German officer ends up sp speaking English to the French farmer, which is like impossible. There's no history in which that happens. But we're going to make up something. And see, Quentin Tarantino just puts it in your face and kind of admits it doesn't make sense. But we're trying to make it make sense to you. Whereas Ridley Scott, here presents a whole movie where French people all speak English. And this is super annoying because eventually they end up being at war with the French, pe with the English. A and it's like, okay, everyone has been speaking English in France for this whole movie. And now, now the big fight of Waterloo ha arrives and who shows up? The English. And now the English are speaking with their, like, the, the people in France in this movie already had a European, English, UK type of accent. So how are you going to make the English look English? Well, they gave them an even more exaggerated English accent. <laughs> so it's like <coughs> the French are there shooting their cannons. And the way this movie distinguishes between the French and the English, they both have the English accent, but they make the English even more English. And also they have cups of teas in their tents. It's like, that is terrible. That is ter a terrible way here where my brain is like, well, haven't we been on the side of the English already? Uh, oh no, yeah, right. They speak English, but it's for the movie. And actually they're French and Napoleon was French. It's super painful to be, to be digesting these uh, historical annoyances and things that just wouldn't happen. So then uh, the movie starts, the first battle, uh, well, the movie starts with the French Revolution. So 1789, 1790, the chopping of the head of uh, Marie Antoinette, uh, who is said to have uh, kind of like this Saira Saira song, which is sung by Edith Piaf in that movie, uh, 150 years later. Uh, her head is chopped. There's a theater place where they mock the, the chopping of her head. Lots of celebrations around the killing of aristocrats. And then from the disorder that the French Revolution does, uh, France is weakened. And Napoleon starts rising as a military commander because he's asked to take back Toulon, which is a French port city. And uh, there has been uh, the... The Royal Navy of the British has been bordering the town with its navy and taken over the town. And the idea of Napoleon is, well, we don't need to take the whole town back. We just need to take the, <clears throat> to take the fort. And if we have the fort, we have the cannons and we can totally uh, sink the Royal Navy. And once their navy is sinked, we, ha we are in the... We are in the, uh, the, 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 the castle or the whatever, whatever that location is, the fort. We are in the fort, they have no navy, and then we have the town. So the whole idea is you don't need much men, you just need enough to do the siege of Toulon. 
uh, people who are history buff, they said uh, that the use of ladders to escalate the fort was absolutely ridiculous, that it never happened, that actually what was used is explosive to pierce a hole in the wall through which the forces of Napoleon were able to enter. And the performance of Joachim Phoenix is kind of weird. It's kind of overly sweaty. <coughs> and, you know, the whole movie, Napoleon is just in these clean, aristocratic uh, costumes. But in this scene, he's like... <laughs> and you can see the sweat on his face. Uh, I guess it could have been interesting to, to have more of this in the movie, to study the contrast between... Was Napoleon one of these aristocrats just giving orders like this? Or was he the, the sweaty type of guy who was getting into it? But uh, yeah, I, I don't know what would be the answer, but it could have been an interesting point, but it's not really exploited in the movie. There's just this weird sweaty moment of Napoleon just escalating the ladders and he's like... Ugh. Uh, and then, uh, you know, receiving a, a cannon... Uh, his horse just gets blown. That's one of the... In terms of innovation of battlefield illustration, there isn't much in this movie. Uh, it's all stuff we've seen before. But the whole cannoning of a horse, <laughs> and you can see the internal organs of the horse just... Uh, that is a kind of interesting CGI for, ba for battle gore. Uh, but there's not much to put your teeth onto. In this movie, you're gonna have to enjoy the cannon, the horse, because it's almost the only thing that that's graphically uh, that touches like the gore levels of Braveheart. Um, yeah, so Josephine, as I indicated uh, previously, the Josephine that is from reality looks like this. Uh, so I would say the Josephine performance by the actress is fit. Vanessa Kirby here. She does a fit Josephine with the kind of um, short hair, short hair, dark hair type of thing. Aristocrat, psychopath of some kind. Uh, it's maybe a little exaggerated, this whole French people only know how to doggy style fuck. Like there's this, there's the, these scenes where Napoleon is fucking her, and it's always doggy style, and it's like, I know, I know, it's a, it's a thing. Like this whole French people, French aristocrats, that's how they fuck, and uh, it's a classic in American cinema to be illustrating some high level CEO fucking their secretary on the desk and in doggy style uh, performance, but it's kind of overly crude how they film it. You have Joachim Phoenix just pop, 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 just fucking her super quick in Dougie style. Uh, I don't know what was the process, the thought process here to kind of make a contrast between their aristocratic manner and the fucking scenes. Uh, I think there's a little bit of her personality that is a psychopathic exploiting of her pussy. Like, I'm going to show you something. You're going to want it forever. It can, I don't know if it's a historically accurate representation of Josephine, but I guess that it's fair to... This couple had massive problems to it. That is certain from the historical record. So what were the problems, and are they overdone, and is her exploitation of sex having any grasp onto Napoleon? Um... Uh, I think that Napoleon comments in his writing in, in real history that he's not really swayed by these sexu sexual uh, things that he, he considers his accomplishments so much more important and he's bound to greatness and ultimately sex only derives from his greatness and his social status. So I think he has, he has an understanding of all this and he's relatively uh, unaffected. Whereas in the movie... He's not presented as an artist who's unaffected by her advances. He's more like moved by and interested by her advances. My guess is the movie has believed too hard in the letters. My guess is when Napoleon writes these letters, 
I am so much in love with you and I love you a thousand times more. I don't think Napoleon feels that way so much. I think Napoleon is more of an abstract thinker and he's not super into sex. Whenever he's there, he wants to have babies, so he does have sex. But the movie presents him as the kind of cock simp that we see in the letters. What the movie should have understood is the letters are sent maybe with deceptive intent. Maybe because it's part of French culture for females to demand this kind of, uh, uh, I love you so much. Uh, uh, I couldn't live without you. I mean, that's how French women expect you to act. So much so that I couldn't maintain a French woman in my life. I've been married to one. And she would be, and she makes me think a lot about Josephine because she would be like, I want you to love me so hard. And I'd be like, okay, I, I love you. I want to have sex with you. I desire your pussy. No, I want you to, I want you to kneel and be wanting my pussy so hard. And it's like, I'm not into this stuff, lady. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have limits to just how much desire I can feel about the physical world. I'm sorry. Uh, so we see a lot of this conflict in, in this movie. It tries to illustrate a real thing about French women historically, is that they, they, are, they are educated into thinking that they're kind of these goddesses that have this weird power over males. And it's kind of annoying when you marry a French woman, honestly, because it's like, yeah, you know, the age of the internet, I, I can see, I can see lots of beautiful women out there. I can order uh, 10,000 JPEGs of absolutely perfect women. It's going to be very hard for me to have saliva at a six out of 10, you know? <clears throat> Joachim Phoenix, way too old for this movie. I mean, look at this and compare it to Napoleon at the peak height of his realizations. Napoleon was a somewhat fat geek artist that was very young. Joachim Phoenix is like a deranged old man who's been starved for his last role. It doesn't work. It is... His face doesn't work for this role because he seems too ruined by life, which is excellent for a dozen other roles. Like the, the face of Joachim Phoenix, just, just tired by life, is awesome for a director, but it's not awesome for Napoleon because Napoleon doesn't get to be... Napoleon was... See, he has cheeks. Napoleon is kind of overweight. Napoleon is youthful. He is. Uh, <clears throat> he, he he doesn't have all of the veteran aspect of Joachim Phoenix, and uh, of course I understand uh, Joachim Phoenix didn't have uh, didn't have the power to recover his youthful uh, baby face. You know, it's impossible to get it back. But maybe it wasn't wise to take Joachim Phoenix then. Maybe it wasn't. Um, French campaign in Egypt and Syria, completely useless part of the movie, where we see Napoleon bombarding the pyramids. We don't know that this actually happened, but it does happen in the movie. And then the, he, he takes over Egypt and he gets to see the local traders, and they're trading a fully preserved mummy. And then there's like this Joachim Phoenix joker moment with the mommy where it takes like a whole minute where he approaches his hand at the face of the mommy and now you hear ghost music and it's like oh my god there's gonna be something happening there's a mommy and there's the whole power of the ghost of egypt backing her and and, and he just touches her and the mommy just falls on the side like this and there, it, it's supposed to be funny, I guess. I guess it's funny how it tries to be funny. Um, but it's like, instead of deepening a 
truly scripted route of this movie. Why, why do we spend a whole minute on this mummy? It doesn't matter. Uh, DK Shadow says a mummy spin-off. So all of this is just to say Napoleon has taken over Egypt. Now in Egypt, he learns about, uh, he learns about the uh, infidelity of Josephine. And as is historically uh, the case, he goes back goes back to France, uh, he returned to her apartment in Milan, only to find it empty. Josephine had left for Genoa, most probably with army officer Hippolyte Charles, with whom she was suspected of having an affair. He waited nine days for her return, but the wait began to arouse his suspicions. So she's always, she's not there when he comes back, and she begs a place back. He accepts her back, but there's suspicion. She, she's always giving trouble, but he never quite have the time to discipline her and, you know, uh, to correct her behavior because he's always out there being in demand for his military actions. We then, uh, then the, the coup de Brumaire happens where a bunch of French uh, people in the elite decide to make a coup d'etat so the way it's represented in the movie is that they take a bunch of politicians, they intimidate them to resign. What happens historically is that they succeed at having three of the five resign, which, uh, which removes the ability of a quorum, because now there's only two of the five people of the directory uh, that are able to vote. Uh, the remaining ones, uh, they pack a bunch of the elite uh, on... on, on <clears throat> on a deceptive uh, story that the, the France is getting attacked and they need protection, they close them into a room. Um, and in that room, they are arguing and everything. And Napoleon comes out of that room. And the brother of Napoleon makes the promise to the military that, you know, Napoleon is totally dedicated to France. And if he was to betray France with his power, I would stab him in the heart. The movie very poorly presents this, these whole things. Because let me tell you, I've watched the movie. I didn't understand any of this. I had to go read the page of Wikipedia to understand what was going on in this part of the movie. Because the movie just throws you and these random French people arguing in a room. I didn't understand that they were put there with a ruse. The ruse was not presented at all. So you, you just end up saying, okay, there's a guy, there's a bunch of guys arguing and Napoleon was in trouble. Uh, eventually they force with guns, they force the two remaining ones to abdicate power. And that's basically a coup d'etat that gives uh, total power to Napoleon. Uh, another thing that is not exploited in the movie is that this whole thing that Josephine is an old infertile woman from the perspective of Napoleon who's younger. That's already an injustice, but there's a parallel story that wasn't at all exploited and it could have been good. Lucien Bonaparte, the brother of Napoleon, is fucking the daughter, the daughter of Josephine. Uh, daughter. <coughs> um, I'm trying to find the, the reference. Anyways, there, there's a relationship between the brother of Napoleon and the woman that he's with. And that could have been, uh, that could have been exploited. And again, it would have made contrast with the fact that Napoleon was fucking an older woman. You don't get the genes, you don't get the, the reproduction, but you're kind of a sterile worker for your brother and he gets the actual productive pussy. None of this has been exploited. At some point we see what I think is the brother of uh, Napoleon at the same table. And there, there's a big argument between Josephine and Napoleon at this point. And maybe, maybe the daughter of Josephine is seated beside Lucien. But that would be the only reference I see to this uh, relationship. Um, and that would be interesting because the daughter is fertile. The daughter gets fucked. That is kind of stepfather porn type of action that I would like to have seen. Uh, but no, it doesn't happen at all. Um, at this argument that they have at the table, you have Napoleon saying, 
you're gonna bear a baby from me tonight or I'm gonna get a divorce. So it's interesting to see that basically the big problem of this couple is that they try having baby and they can't. And she says, there's not enough love making in this house for me to have a baby. And Napoleon says, there's been plenty of it. And in fact, not just by me. <laughs> Napoleon is essentially saying, even with the collective effort of uh, many men in Paris, we all fucked you. And there's no babies coming out of you. <laughs> That is like the ultimate cock position, the, the ultimate cock winning an argument. Uh, it's a hilarious part of the movie, but yeah, I mean, that is also historically real that Napoleon eventually has to get a divorce from Josephine because he has to produce a baby if he's going to take so much power, and this power could be inherited by inheritancy uh, to a hair. He has to have a hair. And uh, so he, he eventually divorces. But before this, we have a scene of the coronation. So Napoleon uh, puts the crown onto the head of Josephine. And that's, that's an illustration of what's also present in the movie, the coronation of Napoleon, also historically accurate based on this painting. Um, where Napoleon puts the crown of the queen, kind of, onto Josephine. Um, <clears throat> then Napoleon, uh, I don't know if it's before the divorce or after the divorce, I think it may be after, uh, he goes to Austerlitz, and we have uh, some of the uh, interesting battle scenes, maybe, of the movie, although it doesn't expand very much. It could have been more epic, it could have been more long. But uh, Napoleon crushes the Austro-Russian army in Austerlitz. And that is a, a classical moment where that was represented in paintings before. So basically, that's a representation of the Austerlitz battle in which uh, there was a strategy over three or four months uh, because the what, what you learn is that the, the way to... The way that the Russians fight is very much by fleeing and by using the temperature changes to their advantage. So they are hard to catch, they flee away, and then winter comes and kills you. That's basically what they do. And I think it's a pretty genius strategy. They do it twice in the movie. Once at Austerlitz and once at Moscow. So at Austerlitz, though, uh, Napoleon had the better of it. Because Napoleon, over three or four months, in the real history of this, he pushes these troops by using their fleeing reaction. Uh, and he, he leads the war of attrition against them. Of course, they have these techniques where they stay in the snow and they're hid, hiding in the forest. And they just shoot three, four cannons to the line of marching French people, French army. And then they, they, they withdraw. So they have much lighter cannons, and they're much more deployable in surprise locations. So that's, that's a war of attrition that actually has weakened Napoleon throughout this campaign. He loses a lot of men. But uh, eventually he gets their pattern, and he gets to push them by over three, four months to where they place where they will be cut, a kind of valley where there's a lake, and the lake is frozen, so at first they think they can march on it, but eventually uh, Napoleon bombards the lake with his cannons, which he had hidden in a, on a stand uh, nearby, and so they all uh, fall into the water and they die from the cold of the water. Now the history buffs are saying, well, you know, historically there may have been just three or four men who have... Uh, drowned in the water whereas in the movie it's like he he, he drowns the whole army i, I mean you, you, he shows it as if it was a victory we don't see twenty thousand people drowning but the, the movie kind of suggests that this resolved the whole war and that somehow this was a massively good strategy for napoleon here we have another painting representation of this scene it's well represented in the movie 
Uh, I don't, not being a history buff and not caring that much about these details, I'm okay with these scenes, but they could have been, they could have been deeper. You know, in Braveheart, <clears throat> there's the build up, there's the collision between the armies, and then there's the gore, just cranium bashing. There, there's not much cranium bashing happening here. And, you know, if, if they're going to drown, don't just show me five seconds of them drowning. Show me, like, show me the distress of the guy and the, uh, and he freezes and he starts having neurological effects. Show me some gore here. We don't get to see any of this because it's too quick, too short, too, too superficial. Um, <clears throat> so after the, uh, after the, um, the divorce, well, even before the divorce, after Josephine had betrayed uh, Napoleon, we know historically that he's still trusting her after this, you know, forgiving her in a way, but he's also taking his own mistresses. And so Napoleon did end up having many illegitimate children. And in the movie, it's not clear, is there a prostitute that he fucks? Or is that his new wife? Eventually, anyways. Eventually, he ends up marrying the Austrian uh, Marie-Louise. Now, it's not clear to me what, what the movie suggests here. I'm confused. I think that he succeeds at impregnating Marie-Louise, which is true. But I think in the movie, he takes the baby and brings it to Josephine for her to raise the baby of Marie-Louise. I'm not sure if I understood correctly, because when you watch a movie... You can't follow all of the details, but it seems that in the movie, he carries a baby from Mary Louise to Josephine. And so this infertile woman gets to care for the baby. I'm not sure about this. Anyways, it's not uh, factually accurate. As far as I know from the history, uh, Mary Louise is a 20-year-old fertile female. He gets a baby with her. She raises the baby in Austria. And he ends up dying of tuberculosis at the age of 21, according to this website, at least. Uh, he named this uh, baby the King of Rome, but since eventually Napoleon fell, uh, it didn't end up meaning anything. <clears throat> so before marrying Mary Louise, he gets an official divorce, the civil annulment, also uh, a accurate historical representation. Dino Logovic says, great film, JF, The Duelist, Ridley's first film. Okay, I'll keep a note on this. Uh, I'll see if, uh, if that's worth watching. Uh, and finally, uh, the two final battles of the movie, the French occupation of Moscow, where they reach Moscow, but the tactic of the Russians still the same. They have fled Moscow. And they have put a, a large section of Moscow, in fact, in, on fire. So they're like, all right, you think, you think that was the end of your travel? If you really want to beat us, you're going to have to go even deeper into Russia. You're going to be faced with, uh, with the winter and you're going to die. So basically, Moscow abandoned and put on fire. That's an actual historical event, although the historians are not sure who started the fire. It is said that it was the, the Russians as part of a uh, scorched earth strategy. In any case, Napoleon cannot get deeper towards St. Petersburg, cannot get deeper into Russia because the winter is coming, and it's kind of a pyrrhic... Uh, it's it's a, a victory that is uh, that comes at high cost because... They made all this travel, all of this for the battle not to happen. And, uh, and uh, so, so they won, but they won a burnt Moscow, which eventually will be rebuilt by the Russians. Uh, and finally, the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, the Battle of Waterloo is represented as, well, now, now that Napoleon is coming back to France, uh, there's all sorts of kingdoms around France that are annoyed. They're all scared of Napoleon being too powerful in Europe, so they team up. Netherlands, English, other countries are also in, but they don't matter so much for the battle. 
So Napoleon sees all of this major army gathering against him, and he, he merely has a bunch of French soldier nationalists that are kind of uh, loyalists to him, despite the fact that he doesn't have any official standing anymore. So he's uh, definitely outnumbered, but he decides to make a gambit that if he can, if he can attack those armies before they gather together, he can beat them one at a time and face a smaller number of them. <clears throat> so basically his goal is to attack quick before these armies are given the chance to regroup and be together, because at that time they would be way too numerous for him to handle. So that is the history of the Battle of Waterloo. Uh, he attacks with his cannons, and it's kind of ridiculous. Uh, it's kind of weird. The movie doesn't intellectually accompany you through this to understand what the fuck is going on in Napoleon's head. It's, 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 he's sending all of his troops to die. And the movie presents this well, you know, that they're going there and they're dying and they're totally outnumbered and losing, but it's, it keeps going and Napoleon keeps sending the orders. And the movie, I don't know if it could have through narration or through intelligent character placement, could have explained better. I would have, under, I would have wanted to understand better. Why is Napoleon doing all this? Does he believe he will win? Or is it, is it just like a last suicide desperate move? We don't even get a thesis in the movie. He just does it. Napoleon is like, send in the infantry. Um, okay. And then there's the whole key uh, formation of the English. They form a square, and it's a square of infantry. And the horses, the cavalry, as they attack these squares, the horses have the, the kind of natural reaction not to, not to go into the spears, but they start running in round around the squares. They are squares of like 200, 300 people, uh, maybe more. 200, 300 people with guns and with bayonets. And so the, the horses don't charge the square because they're scared of the bayonet. So they start running around the, the, the square. And this leaves all of the time for the guns to be used to shoot all these horses. So it's a kind of human formation that outcompetes the cavalry. Uh, and that, that seems to be a key to the victory of the English against Napoleon. So he loses the Battle of Waterloo, but the English kidnap him and they don't kill him. They decide not to kill him. And he, he's already, uh, as he's just handcuffed and in some sort of prison place, but he's not even handcuffed. He's, he's actually living as an aristocrat prisoner. Because they get him, uh, he's, we can see him eating oysters, I think. And he's already teaching to the youth uh, English soldier his old strategies. And he's explaining that he lost the Battle of Waterloo because although he knows how to precisely set the angle of a cannon, he doesn't know how to communicate this to his lower, uh, lower armies. And so training has always been the problem of of Napoleon because he's too autistic. That, that is how the movie finishes. And the English decide to give him a good life uh, on an island where he will be banished from entering Europe, but he can keep living on the island. And I believe we see him at the end of the movie with his children. Uh, so that is uh, what the movie is. Uh, new guy says, it wasn't a matter of aiming cannons, Jesus. Well, that is... that. The, the movie doesn't tell you this is the reason he lost. The movie tells you this is the excuse that he would use to look good in front of the youth. Um, <coughs> new guy says they poisoned him. Really? The, do they poison him at the, uh, at the end of the movie? Maybe I missed the last minutes, but I, I don't, this movie doesn't seem like he was poisoned. Uh, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe I didn't pay attention at the very end, but the oysters looked okay. Uh, anyways, what I retain from this movie is that if you make a historical epic where you allow yourself... Okay, in real life, he was poisoned. Okay, I didn't know. 
if you make a historical epic in which you are allowing yourself uh, violations of historical reality, I'm all fine about it. But you have to make your story more interesting than reality. Napoleon is not more interesting than the Wikipedia pages I read about it, and that's a big problem. Thank you for watching this clip. This is the CACA Dolphin. Remember to like and subscribe.